You're listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to discuss the war on meat. (laughs) What is going on with this whole scenario here? The war on meat. Seriously. Uh, This is bizarre stuff. Uh, 
uh, in our world today. Uh, I understand uh, there's there's always been a push uh, uh, from a certain sector of society towards veganism or something similar to that, uh, and and that's all well and good, and I understand the moral implications and the reasoning behind that. Uh, but what we're talking about goes way beyond moral values, okay? There is an actual war against meat going on right now, and this is promulgated by people in positions of power. And to prove that tonight, we're going to read a white paper from the World Economic Forum and your buddy Uncle Klaus, uh, who wants you to remind you that you will eat the bugs. Uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to take a look at this white paper. And here is the title of this white paper, and you're going to love this. Meat, the future series, alternative proteins. <laughs> I kid you not. Meat, the future series. Uh, they've been thinking about this for a good long time. This was published in January of 2019. Um, of course, this whole ideology has, you know, gone way, way back. Uh, I, I would remind you of the movie Soylent Green uh, if you want a picture of what they have in mind uh, in certain scenarios here. But uh, this is directly from the World Economic Forum, and we're going to go through it here. And this is from January 2019, World Economic Forum, All Rights Reserved. And it says, prepared by the Oxford Martin School, Oxford University, for the World Economic Forum's Meet the Future Dialogue series. The white, this white paper has been published by the World Economic Forum as a contribution to a project, insight area, or interaction. The findings, interpretations, and conclusions expressed herein are a result of a collaborative process facilitated and endorsed by the World Economic Forum, but whose results do not necessarily represent the views of the World Economic Forum, nor the entirety of its members, partners, or other stakeholders. I'm going to pause there, folks. Am I the only one that finds it ironic that uh, <laughs> they're, they they are um, issuing this war against meat and they, they want alternative proteins, but they actually call people stakeholders? <laughs> I'm a stakeholder. I, I, I hold the ribeyes and the sirloins. I, I like all the different various steaks, folks. Uh, but, uh, you know, seriously, though, uh, this is just uh, quite the agenda that they have here. And, of course, this has to do with all of their Agenda 2030 nonsense and all their quote-unquote sustainable development uh, nonsense that goes with it. So, uh, you know, we'll read a little bit into here, and, of course, I'll add my two cents as I see fit. And I might laugh at it a little bit here tonight and stuff, but uh, there's a very serious agenda that goes way, way back. And uh, it relates to many esoteric factors in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so we might uh, actually, you know, go down that little tangent side trail here at some point. But uh, let's get into the paper here. Forward. Alternative proteins that can act as substitutes for traditional animal-based food are attracting considerable financial investment, research attention, and interest in the media as a pathway to meeting the nutritional needs and food demands of a predicted mid-century population of 10 billion in a healthy and sustainable manner. And I'm going to pause. There's the word sustainable right there. Take a shot. <laughs> We're going to play the, the take a shot every time you hear the words sustainable, robust, or uh, non-fragile or anti-fragile here. Uh, so if, if you hear those terms, take a shot, right? Uh, this I, I won't have an audience left by the end of the paper, I'm sure. But anyway, let's, let's read on here. Many of these potentially disruptive alternatives are enabled by the Fourth Industrial Revolution and come with big promises, from reducing greenhouse gas emissions to transforming nutrition and health. This report investigates these claims using a food systems lens, employing quantitative models developed by the Oxford Martin School. The analysis shows that a wide range of protein alternatives can have important environmental and health benefits. The report illuminates sensitive intervention points at which multi-stakeholder discussions and new platforms for public-private collaboration are needed. It also notes gaps in knowledge where further exploration will be required. An important finding of this research is that showing the benefits of these products is not sufficient for consumers to adopt them. And I'm going to pause there, folks. There's your caveat right there, okay? That... Uh, you know, just the, the simple uh, 
way of showing the health benefits of these products, uh, it, it's not sufficient enough for consumers to uh, actually switch to those products. So what does that tell you about those products? Nobody friggin' wants them. <laughs> they probably taste terrible, and nobody wants to eat that. Okay, I'm thinking of bug paste, okay? That's what I have in mind when I'm talking about this stuff. Or uh, another one that they like is using sea algae, and that was the whole premise of the movie Soylent Green. That's what they claimed uh, that the Soylent Green was made from was made from algae from the sea but here's the kicker part folks here's the spoiler alert for the movie and probably the spoiler alert for the world economic forums war on meat soylent green is people <laughs> soylent green is people if you've ever taken anything from predictive programming from uh, uh, the entertainment sector remember that movie soylent green okay I, I actually I think it was actually based in the year 2022 if I remember correctly too, uh, so that that's an interesting uh, crossover there. But at any rate, let's read on here and see what they have to say here because uh, they've already admitted just you know the 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 sheer fact that we've researched this and shown that there's many benefits to using these uh, meat alternatives. Uh, well, that's not enough that the consumers will actually want to adopt them. So what, what does that imply? That implies they're going to have to try to regulate uh, this thing into existence, right? Let's read on and see what they have in mind. A much wider set of interventions will be required to accelerate uptake. To this end, the analysis in this report first uses social science techniques. Let me translate that for you folks. Social science techniques. Social engineering. Mind control programming. Uh, to look at cr a critical determinant of adoption, the interplay of narratives that are developing in regard to the costs and benefits of alternative proteins. Chiefly, using information from North American and European markets, where alternative proteins are more advanced and available, the report seeks an understanding of which narratives have been most impactful or detrimental in affecting the acceptance and purchase of these products. Next, the assessment focuses on the political economy and regulatory environments that can support such a transformation, recognizing the critical role of these elements that these elements play in the food system. And I'm going to pause right there, folks. There you go. They're going to regulate this into existence. They're going to say you can't you can't have this meat. Uh, they're going to use regulations in the meat processing field uh, to make it uh, not beneficial for uh, manufacturers of that uh, said product. Uh, meat processing plants, it's not going to make them profitable to stay in business because they're going to regulate the crap out of them and make it so that it's it's almost impossible for them to turn a profit or to make it into a desirable type business. So they're going to regulate meat out of the market here very soon. Watch and see. Don't we see this going on already? They've already come up with these contrived uh, different reasons for shortages on different things. Like uh, right now there's allegedly a shortage of eggs and chicken and poultry because of the the... the avian flu <gasps> not the flu the avian flu uh they've they've had to uh, falsely uh destroy a lot of these uh poultry products and i say products and uh, that's not really very kind because uh, we're talking chickens folks They're, they've they've gone out and destroyed a uh, whole uh, you know a farmer's whole supply of chickens that they have on their farms and such in the name of being afraid of the bird flu or the avian flu, right? Or the spread of such a thing. So uh, this is all contrived. And once again, we see all of the artificial scarcity being produced here, right? And they will use these kind of justifications and regulatory systems to do this stuff. They're going to regulate it right out of existence, the, the market here. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-vegan or anti-vegetarian or anything like that. If that floats your boat, that's fine. But, uh, you know, if you, you want to eat that way, I'm good with that. I understand there are health benefits and there's, there's a lot of uh, legitimate moral reasons for choosing that path. Uh, but the point here is that uh, there's, there's many people that uh, for biological reasons, they can't sustain... Uh, healthy body equilibrium without these types of animal proteins. Uh, so there are those out there that do consume meat and 
you kind of need to to stay healthy. Uh, it all depends upon your heritage and uh, your genetics and things of that nature. But uh, by and large here, there's this war going on against meat, right? And like I said earlier, there are various reasons for that. And one of those is quite an esoteric reason that we might get into a little here later. But I want to just kind of stay on focus with the paper here and see what it is they have planned here for us in the very near future and why they're they're touting uh, this kind of a rollover into uh, processed meat products and meat substitutes and things like that. And to think of like the, the Beyond Burger or the, uh, what, what's the other one, the Impossible Burger. All of these things, how they've, they've made, uh, they used uh, genetically modified soy protein to produce these things. And lo and behold, uh, you get 44 grams of estrogen in a, an Impossible Burger. Did you know that? <laughs> you get 44 grams of estrogen in an Impossible Burger. And a lot of that because that's based upon the, the genetically modified soy protein that they use in it. But anyway, let, let's not focus on that. But let's get into uh, a little bit more of the paper here. Finally, the analyses are brought together to present recommendations on multi-stakeholder actions that may be required to accelerate adoption of beneficial alternatives and to minimize the negative impact from the disruption of current protein delivery systems. I'm going to pause there, folks. you got to love their freaking language, don't you? Protein delivery systems. Um, you mean like eating meat? <laughs> what do you mean protein delivery systems? What are you going to do? Let's turn this into a, a bug paste and you can suck down the bug paste. There's a protein delivery system for you. Uh, <laughs> I can't. I, I can't stand these people. I really, truly can't. Uh, these these egghead academicians and, you know, academics out there that, that try to put together these these. <laughs> Papers. The way they refer to everything, it's it's retarded. I'm sorry. I, I like using the word retarded. I, I'm sure you folks have noticed that by now, because it is by definition retarded. All of this stuff, it's 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 a lowering of the human psyche. Okay, it's it's a uh, degradation and a hindrance to the human psyche. The way that they behave and uh, you know the things they come up with here in order to lower the human mind even further. So uh, that's exactly what goes on. But uh, let's read on. An important conclusion from the report is that, for the foreseeable future, the meat and protein alternatives industries will coexist, and that, as a result, there are great opportunities for synergies. Indeed, it is unlikely that alternative proteins will achieve scale unless use is made of the production and marketing experience of the traditional protein sector. <laughs> I'm going to pause there. Okay, so they're going to do the old bait and switch here, right? They're going to do the same thing that the wackadoodle green movement is doing, right? It's, you know, the, the whole save the environment, let's go with, uh, you know, solar and let's go with wind power and all these alternative energies uh, type infrastructures and stuff like that. You know who owns those infrastructures and is heavily vested in those infrastructures, folks? The big oil companies. <laughs> it's the same thing here. Let's get the, the meat processing people involved with the uh, quote-unquote alternative protein markets. Yeah, that'll end well, won't it? <laughs> so you, you can understand how it's, uh, you know, it, it, this whole thing's disingenuous from the get-go. Anyway, as far as like the, any kind of moral reasoning behind this, there's no moral reasoning behind this, folks. Make no doubt about that. It, it all has to do with something other than morals. Let's read on. Alternative proteins represent a rapidly emerging new domain within the food system. The analyses in this report are not definitive and further work will be needed as the evidence base technologies and production methods evolve in order both to assess additional factors and to understand the full costs of transitioning away from traditional animal-based products in more developed countries as an important source of dietary protein. It is intended, however, that this research will open up further debate and discussion to help shape a more inclusive, sustainable healthy and safe future. Are you taking your shots there with sustainable again? I haven't seen the word robust yet, but I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Let's, let's read on here. But you see how it's all about inclusivity? Ooh, that's the big term, isn't it? It's got to be inclusive and diverse, right? 
Inclusivity, diversity, all of these Agenda 2030 buzzwords. And it used to be Agenda 21, but then they switched it to Agenda 2030 when, you know, they didn't get everything in place in time for it to be a proper Agenda 21. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that's the way that it goes. I think they they might roll it back at some point and call it Agenda 2050 or something like that, too. <laughs> you know, if we keep pushing back hard enough. Uh, let's read on here. This paper was prepared by the Oxford Martin School, Oxford University, as an input for the World Economic Forum's Meet the Future, an initiative of the World Economic Forum launched in early 2018 to help accelerate the agenda for change in the world's protein systems. Let me read that again. For the agenda for change in the world's protein systems. You catch all that? (laughs) <laughs> they're telling you exactly what they want to do here it's it's not ambiguous in any shape or form uh, they're not subtle about it they're telling you exactly what they have in mind they're telling you it's an agenda folks it truly is an agenda and uh you know it's all about changing the world's quote-unquote protein systems well what's that mean what does that mean you will eat the bugs that's what that means let's read on It specifically focuses on the role of alternative proteins as one of three pathways to accelerate the provision of universally accessible, healthy, and sustainable protein to a growing population, in particular by encouraging multi-stakeholder collaboration. And I'm going to pause there, folks. There was sustainable again. Are you taking your shots? I think I'm going to use the term multi-stakeholder. I'm going to include that in this this particular paper because it's all about the multi-stakeholders isn't it and i I still find it ironic that they (laughs) they're talking about stakeholders when they're trying to take away your stakes so (laughs) you know i take i take offense to that because i i do love a good ribeye or a sirloin or a new york strip steak um i like it all i I mean i i am a meat eater um I'll, i'll admit to that uh but uh you know that's that's neither here nor there anyway let's read on So uh, the uh, person here who wrote the foreword, he says, I am grateful to my colleagues at Oxford who contributed to this report. Marco Springman, who led on the modeling. Alex Sexton, who led on the social science analysis. John Lynch, Cameron Hepburn, and Susan Jeb. We are grateful to Lisa Sweet, World Economic Forum, and to a number of external reviewers for incisive comments. I wonder if they would like my incisive comments. (laughs) Somehow I doubt that. (laughs) Let's get more into the paper here. We got a lot to go yet. Introduction. By 2050... Oh, hold on. I'm going to pause for a second there. 2050. (laughs) Didn't they tell you they might switch Agenda 2030 to Agenda 2050? At some point I was joking, but they're saying by 2050 right here in the introduction of the paper. That's, That's hysterical. By 2050... Global food systems will need to meet the dietary demands of more than 10 billion people who, on average, will be wealthier than people today. (laughs) Okay, hold on. Time out. Time out. Okay, so you're telling me that 10 billion people, they'll be wealthier than they are today. Somehow, I don't think so in uh, the... In the aftermath of all the crap you guys just pulled the past two years. I don't think that's the case. And I don't think it's going to be 10 billion people. Sorry. Maybe that's why you guys have done what you did. Right? Maybe that's why. Because you're expecting, uh, you know, if you didn't do anything about it, there'd be 10 billion people and they'd be wealthier. And you can't have that, right? You can't have a a proper neo-feudalist system if your average person, you know, actually has a leg up. Right? Uh, we, we can't have that. We can't have prosperity. Uh, let's bring in the artificial scarcity again. Let's do this and that. And anyway, that's that's enough of me rambling about that. But uh, let's see. So where do we leave off? Okay, so they're saying, uh, you know, uh, global food systems will need to meet the dietary demands of more than 10 billion people who on average will be wealthier than people today and will aspire to the type of food choices currently available only in high-income countries. 
This food will have to be produced sustainably, there it is, in ways that contribute to reducing climate change and that address other environmental challenges. <laughs> they got to get their climate change in there, don't they? Uh, at the same time, human health is influenced more by food than any other single factor. Time out. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Time out. So you're actually admitting that nutrition, rather than, yeah, say, seeing your doctor and, and going to your uh, pharmaceutical-based medical system, uh, is, is actually the key to health. Nutrition is, really? Is that what you're saying here? Are you admitting that? World Economic Forum? I think you are, aren't you? Well, that's a shocking revelation, isn't it? Not really, but anyway, that's that's kind of what you're saying here. Hmm. Well, your petroleum-based pharmaceuticals, I, I thought they were the cure-all, right? I thought that's what, what health was about. Health is in an injection and in a bottle, right? That That's, that's what you've been promoting the past two years. But now you're going to say the, the truth? Because it suits your agenda, right? That that food, food, nutrition is key to health. Let's read on. Health is influenced more by food than any other single factor, and facilitating healthy diets is critical both for individual well-being and containing the costs of treating illnesses. It is widely recognized that the current trajectory of the food system will not allow us to meet these goals. Really? <laughs> you don't say. The food system needs to change radically to address these challenges, and a very important part of this will be the adoption of new technologies. Of course it will be new technologies, folks. They're technocrats. Of course they want new technologies to do the job. Including the opportunities provided by the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The food sector has been relatively slow at capitalizing on recent technological advances. For example, the World Economic Forum's 2018 Innovation with a Purpose report showed that cumulative startup investments since 2010 are more than 10 times greater for health care than for food. I'm going to pause there. No kidding! You want to know why? Because you regulated the restaurant industry and the food industry almost out of business already, folks. That's what they've done. The world governments and, uh, you know, uh, national governments, local governments, state governments, they've almost regulated your average mom-and-pop restaurateur and, uh, you know, food business uh, person, food manufacturer. They've almost regulated them completely out of business because of all the regulation. It's over the top and it's ridiculous. The things you need to do, the hoops you need to jump through just in order to run a business associated with food. It's ridiculous. I could tell you as an insider from the restaurant industry, I've seen it all, right? Uh, I've worked uh, in, in food science and, uh, you know, retail and uh, restaurant uh industry businesses through all phases of the supply chain uh, throughout different portions of my life. So I've seen an awful lot of what goes on and I've seen all the regulation that goes on with these things. It's absurd, beyond absurd, and it's it's not attractive for any kind of a new startup to try to even operate in that uh, that field. So that's what they've done here. Okay, so that would explain why, uh, by and large, there's more Advances in startup monies going into healthcare than food. Okay. However, this does now seem to be changing, and one of the areas attracting the greatest attention and investment is alternative proteins and meat substitutes. How this sector will develop is far from clear, but there is a possibility of genuine disruption in the near future. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. <laughs> I, I haven't really come across too many people that are really keen on this whole meat substitute idea because if you're somebody that eats meat on a regular basis, you've you've tried some of the, the soy-based products and, and various things that they try to substitute for meat, and it's not the same. It doesn't have the same taste or flavor. It doesn't have the same, uh, you know, nutrients that you need. Uh, it's 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 not the same. Let's put it that way. So if you're used to eating one thing and they're trying to convince you to eat this other thing, um, I don't think it's going to work, guys. People have their preferences, and they have their preferences for different reasons, okay? Uh, so <clears throat> with that being said, 
you're 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 really not winning anybody over with this idea right out of the gate okay and and you know that They, they know this they know they're not winning anybody over with this argument that we need sustainable new meat substitute products right they know nobody's buying but yet they're going to push it anyway. They're going to, like I said, what they'll do, and they've talked about it here already, they're going to regulate the meat industry out of business so that they have no choice but to adopt these silly alternatives. And uh, I don't think it's destined to end well. But let's read on here. Next part of the paper here, it says, The Special Challenge of Meat. It would be impossible for a global population of 10 billion people to eat the amount of meat typical of diets in North America and Europe and keep within the agreed sustainable development goals for the environment and climate. It would require too much land and water and lead to unacceptable greenhouse gas and other pollutant emissions. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to pause there. (laughs) Okay. So here's here, here's a couple important points to break down in that. Uh, why 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 is Bill Gates buying up all the farmland? Well, this is why because they don't want people to farm it, right? They don't want people to develop these things because of their sustainable development goals. There's the word sustainable again. It's it's just over the top. And now they're talking about greenhouse gas and other pollutant emissions. So here's the premise. Okay, here's here's what they're concerned about. The cows are farting too much and they're destroying the earth. <laughs> So, therefore, they need to cut down the amount of cows that are out wandering the plains, <laughs> eating up all the farm uh, vegetables and, and stuff like that, <laughs> and leaving their sickening emissions <laughs> in the air. Okay, the the, car, the cows are farting too much, and it's, it's warming the earth. It's causing climate change. The cow farts. <laughs> Let's read on. In addition... Excess meat consumption and current production have significant effects on human health, livelihoods, and the economy. Meat thus poses a special challenge to the future development of the global food system. Meat has a special place in human diets. Modern human beings have an innate preference for meat as it is both energy-dense and protein-rich. And we evolved in an environment where energy and protein were scarce. And I'm going to pause there, folks. There's scarcity again, artificial scarcity, right? Always with these people, they, they try to imply that there's scarcity. There's a lack of resources. There's not enough resources in the world to accommodate all the people here. This, this goes back to the ideas of Malthus. This is Malthusian ideas. This goes back to the late 1700s where Malthus... Uh, introduced the idea of scarcity to the world and uh, the idea that the population was too high. There were too many people using too few finite resources, and this was going to cause a problem. And he came up with all kinds of theoretical concepts based on this, and they still go on about it today. And out of this was birthed the eugenics movement uh, as one thing, right? Uh, So, you know, all these ideas, they all go back to the same places all the time. And it's it's just crazy to think in that way. But uh, where did we leave off here? Meat has an it, sorry. Meat has important social as well as nutritional functions. And in many societies, the consumption and provision of certain types of meat signals status or hospitality. There is also a long history of meat abstinence in different societies and complex taboos preventing people from consuming particular types of meat and probably have their origins in their avoidance of food poisoning. These strong cultural and biological drivers have a significant effect on efforts to change diets, as we have seen over time in relation to many public health campaigns designed to promote healthier consumption. Healthier consumption. Isn't that nice? It's nice that they use the word consumption, isn't it? Because that's what it's all about. Consumerism. Right? Materialism. Consumerism. They want you to buy, buy, buy. Go out there and buy. Right. In some low-income countries, the consumption of meat is important in providing a full and nutritious diet. And at least at present, there are no viable alternatives with comparable energy and nutrient density. Often, livestock production is also central to livelihoods and economic resilience. And I'm going to pause there. Yes, it is. There's many cattle ranchers and, uh, you know, uh, people who run... uh, farms 
that operate on that premise. So yeah, there are a lot of livelihoods that uh, depend upon this food system, as you call it, right? And it is important. So, uh, you know, what, what's the plan here? Let's read on. The importance of meat and livestock in these communities is explored in the 2019 International Livestock Research Institute report, Options for the Livestock Sector in Developing and Emerging Economies to 2030 and Beyond, also prepared as an input for the meat, the future dialogues. So they have another program here that was prepared for this World Economic Forum program talking about this and of course they directly name 2030 don't they of course they do they it, it's the same old same old nonsense as always the whole green agenda is not very green folks um you know soylent green anyone <laughs> let's read on meat provides protein and a variety of micronutrients such as iron and b-complex vitamins these are also available from other sources, and most people in middle- and high-income countries who eat a reasonably varied diet consume sufficient quantities for good health, though attention is needed on particular issues such as iron intake during pregnancy. The single greatest effect of diet on health is through energy intake, and the world is currently experiencing an epidemic of the diseases associated with being overweight and obese. And I'm going to pause right there, folks. Notice that they point out an epidemic of diseases associated with being overweight and obese, right? Notice that. Keep that in mind, that this was written in 2019, January of 2019. Keep that in mind as we, we go forward. Keep that, that thought in the back of your head. Let's read on. Though meat is energy dense, it is typically comprised of a relatively small fraction of energy intake and is not per se considered to be a specific risk factor for obesity in adults. There is evidence, though, that meat consumption is associated with the risk of contracting specific diseases. The evidence base is still limited, but most concern is with red meat and, in particular, processed meat. Well, I wonder why processed meat it makes you sick. Hmm? Could it be all the unnatural things that they put in processed meat? <laughs> you got to think about it, folks. The more processed something is, the more unnatural it is, right? Uh, so, you know, that, that should tell us something anyway. But let, let's read on. Much of the debate about meat production today centers on its environmental impact and in particular its greenhouse gas emissions <laughs> there it is again the cows fart too much <laughs> impacts vary greatly between livestock types and production systems red meat then they have in parentheses here cow sheep and goat production is a particularly large source of greenhouse gases because of methane production in ruminant digestion <laughs> I'm going to pause for a second. They really are saying the cows fart too much. They really are. <laughs> Let's read on. Approximately 15% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock production. <laughs> the cows fart too much. About 3% is due to dairy production, of which 40% are due to beef and dairy farming. Livestock rearing can also be a source of dispersed endpoint pollution. <laughs> including by nitrogen, phosphorus, and pathogenic microorganisms, especially where rules on manure and slurry management are lacking or poorly enforced. And I'm going to pause there. The, this is one of the ways that they're going to uh, regulate this industry out of business, right? When you, when you just heard there what they were alluding to, right, is that, uh, you know, in order to... Uh, uh, be sustainable, so to say, and to stave off global warming and, uh, you know, uh, the rise of disease and stuff like that. They need to manage uh, these these different facets of um, meat and dairy production, right? Uh, because it's talking about livestock rearing can also be a source of dispersed and point pollution, including by nitrogen, phosphorus, and pathogenic microorganisms, especially where rules on manure and slurry management are lacking or poorly enforced. So uh, if you're not doing the right things with the cow's poop, right? <laughs> if you're not disposing of it properly, well, that could be very bad. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's the argument they're using. Let's read on. 
The need for grazing land and for arable land to grow animal feed is the single most important driver of deforestation, with consequences for greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity. There's your diversity, folks. It's biodiversity this time because the cows, they fart too much and they eat too much uh, grass, and uh, this is a direct uh, uh, contributor to deforestation. See, it's, it's all the farmer's fault. <laughs> There's too many cows. There's too many cows. They're farting around too much. And they're causing all kinds of problems with the biodiversity. Where livestock are reared on land that cannot be used to grow arable crops, this can contribute to mitigating climate change by helping store carbon in the soil. However... The contributions are relatively small and often undermined by poor land management or overgrazing. It is also important to think of the opportunity cost of using land for livestock rearing that might be used for other environmentally important functions such as carbon sequestration through reforestation. And I'm going to pause there. They love their big words, carbon sequestration through reforestation. So... Yeah, you, know, you could plant trees there. <laughs> That's what they're saying. <laughs> you, you could maybe you could better use the land by planting trees, right? Anyway, let's read on. Rearing, distributing, and selling animal sourced food is responsible for the livelihood of millions of people throughout the world. It has been estimated that roughly three percent of gross global productivity. Uh, global GDP, it says in parentheses, is from agriculture, of which 40% is from a livestock. It provides livelihoods for approximately 1 billion people, overwhelmingly concentrated in low-income countries, including some of the poorest countries on Earth. So I'm going to pause there. So let me get this straight. So you want to take away the sole livelihood <laughs> of... Uh, people in poor countries so you're gonna starve them to death what are you, what are you going to do here what do you have in mind <laughs> i'll tell you these these world economic forum people they're kind of devious aren't they uh they're saying it's largely the third world countries that uh, are going to suffer the most from their war on meat that's coming here let's read on in discussing meat substitutes and the need to reduce global meat consumption, it is very important to ensure that no policies are enacted that negatively affect the health or livelihoods of some of the world's poorest and most disadvantaged groups that are dependent on meat and livestock. In a similar manner, there is also potential for disruption of the livelihoods of people in middle and high income countries, especially those with no other opportunities for employment, and these transition costs will have to be considered and planned for carefully, as has been seen in the transition away from fossil fuel based jobs. And I'm going to pause there, folks. Didn't I just uh, open the show with that comparison? How they were talking about. Uh, how they're going to get the meat manufacturers in on this uh, meat substitute or meat alternative market, right? And it's the same thing. They just said here that, uh, you know, it's, it's the same way that it was with these fossil fuel-based jobs, right? Well... What are the fossil fuel-based jobs doing? Well, they're, they're, they're working on this sustainable energy thing. So all the big oil companies are the ones that are making money uh, putting up these uh, uh, windmills and, you know, all of this other ridiculous alternative energy stuff that uh, is just as messy, if not more so, than, you know, the, the oil and all the other things that we use. They're, they're going about it all wrong. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, when, when you get involved, the people that created the problem to try to solve the problem, it's not going to end well, is it? Uh, if they're going to just make money on creating the, more of a problem and, uh, you know, coming up with an alternative for what it is they already sell, it's not going to work, is it? <laughs> Think about that. It just doesn't make any sense. But this is this is the, the attitude they have, right? Let's read on. In short, public support for alternative proteins will most likely be suppressed if the social costs of their adoption are seen to be too high. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. People don't want it. Like, it, it. It's not a big mystery right now, is it? Most people that eat meat on a consistent basis, they are not interested in your stupid meat substitutes you're coming up with. Your average person won't eat that. 
unless they have some health concerns or uh, some moral or ethical concerns about animals. And that's completely understandable, right? That is completely understandable, and that's probably, you know, one of the only reasons that I, I, I could see somebody adopting that type of a diet for moral or ethical reasons. And that's all well and good, but, uh, you know, if, if you're going to stray away from eating meat, then why would you want a substitute for meat? What, something that tastes like the meat. Like, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I digress on that point, but uh, let's, let's read on. It is because of the critical importance of meat to the sustainability of the food system that so much attention is paid to future trends in meat consumption. Meat consumption in high-income countries is high but relatively constant, while consumption is rising rapidly in China and less rapidly in most other regions, with India being the main exception. Overall, global meat consumption is rising with no sign of a plateau. Projections such as those discussed in the above-referenced ILRI report, options for the livestock sector in developing and emerging economies to 2030 and beyond, show these trends continuing, with Asia in particular rapidly converging on Western levels of consumption. The pathway is incompatible with keeping global temperatures from rising more than two, let alone five, one and a half degrees Celsius, with and with meeting several of the sustainable development goals. Okay, time out. You greedy meat eater. Don't you know you're raising the global temperature by two degrees if you eat meat? <laughs> These people are so retarded. I'm telling you. <laughs> The cows, they fart too much. <laughs> They're raising the temperature of the earth. <laughs> panic, panic, panic. <laughs> Let's read the next section. This just gets worse and worse as we go, I'm sure. <laughs> Innovation and alternative proteins. The meat. The future initiative lays out three potential pathways to meet the needs of the world's growing population for protein in a sustainable and healthy way. Alternative proteins, changes to current production systems, and consumer behavior change. Let me read that last one again. Consumer behavior change. It's always about trying to manipulate people, isn't it? Always with these people. They, they get off on it, don't they? They love to manipulate people. This report focuses on the first pathway, developing alternative protein products. Here, there has been a burst of recent innovation involving new purely plant-based alternatives, products based on insects and other novel protein sources, and the application of cutting-edge biotechnology to develop cultured meat. <laughs> you will eat the bugs. Thanks, Uncle Klaus. Let's read on. A continuum can be drawn from protein-rich plants that are used in unprocessed forms to substitute for meat in meals, lentils, for example, through more processed products such as soy-based tofu and wheat-based seltin to, rec to recent innovations seeking to make vegetable burgers and other products that are I as indistinguishable as possible from real meat. And I'm going to pause there, folks. You can tell the freaking difference. You could. I'm sorry. As close as you try to make them, you haven't come up with an acceptable one that, that somebody would not be able to tell the difference yet. Sorry. It's just not happening. People could tell. <laughs> you could tell. Uh, let's, let's read on here. Innovation is occurring across this spectrum from novel recipes and marketing to increase the desirability of less processed vegetable alternatives through advances in food processing involving existing blends and flavors to highly sophisticated biotechnology that combines products from multiple plant sources to create a mouth feel and experience that closely mimics meat. <laughs> Sorry, it's not working. You can still tell the difference. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's read on. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm laughing a little too much at this one tonight. <laughs> this this one's just... Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's read on. A focus in the past decade has been to develop protein from sources other than traditional crops and livestock. To date, the most commercially successful novel products are those based on fungi, fungi-derived protein, mycoprotein. Going to pause there. Shrooms. 
Shroom protein. That's awesome. Insects have also received considerable attention in particular because they can be reared on feed that is unsuitable for livestock and which otherwise would be wasted or have low economic value, thus contributing to a more circular agricultural economy. <laughs> okay, folks. So there, the argument here is, well, we could use the bugs because we could raise lots of bugs and they will eat all the crap that nothing else will eat. <laughs> Do you want to eat the stuff that 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 eats the stuff that nothing else will eat? <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> that. That is like uh, the the lowest lowest of the low, isn't it? Uh, so this this will contribute to a more circular agricultural economy. So basically, uh, we have these waste products, these these byproducts of uh, you know this industry and we want to be able to use them for something so let's feed them to the bugs the bugs will eat them so then if the bugs eat them then we could use the bugs as food and uh, we have this this new cycle right it's the same thing with uh, you know fluoride being an industrial waste product from uh, the manufacture of iron uh, and steel so uh, they decided let's find a use for this so uh, let's put it in the toothpaste let's put it in the water yeah, we'll tell people it's good for their gums. It's good for your gums. Put it on your gums. <laughs> it's good for your teeth. <laughs> Drink the fluoride. Uh, it's a neurotoxin. But uh, <laughs> that's beside the point. So it's the same kind of thing here. Industrial waste. We'll use the bugs to eat the industrial waste. Don't you see? It's a win-win. And then the people eat the bugs that ate the industrial waste. Wait a minute. <laughs> what doesn't sound right about that? <laughs> Nothing to these guys. They, it sounds perfectly logical to them because they're not going to eat this crap. <laughs> That's for you and me, not for them. <laughs> Let's read on. Innovation in this area includes the discovery and investigation of new insect species of value for food production and developments in how they may be produced economically at scale. Insects can be consumed in their natural state, although to increase acceptability in cultures where insect consumption is not traditional, there is also research into developing novel products that contain insects in a different form, for instance, as flour. <laughs> Bug bread. That's great. <laughs> Here's your insect bread. Your bug bread. <laughs> oh, these guys kill me. They kill me. <laughs> All right, so they're going to make the bugs into flour now. That That's just friggin' wonderful. <laughs> All right, let's read on. Producing meat in the laboratory without the involvement of living animals is a huge technical feat made possible by the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Only in the past decade have technologies advanced enough to make this conceivable with forms of meat that might be used in products which traditionally contained minced meats, such as burgers, already quite advanced and projected to be available to the public in the next few years. Furthermore, through more fundamental research into stem cell technology and muscle development and its medical applications in fields such as wound healing, there is a real prospect of rapid advances within in the consumable meat sector in the next decade. In addition to producing products that resemble meat... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> products that resemble meat. <laughs> okay. Some food futurologists also envisage new products outside our current sensory experience that will create new food cultures outside our current sensory <laughs> experience. <laughs> uh, what are they gonna do lace the meat with lsd now or what <laughs> come on man let's <sighs> read on here oh uh, yeah yeah i lost my place here i'm laughing too much at this crap tonight <laughs> anyway Another target of innovation is not to produce products that replace meat completely, but to partially substitute or extend meat. <laughs> I think that's called Viagra. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself sometimes. <laughs> 
<laughs> Any of the above protein substitutes could be used in this approach, though plant-derived mycoproteins and insect-derived proteins are especially suitable as they can be produced relatively cheaply today and can be incorporated with relatively minimal additional processing. Most interest and in investment in alternative proteins is currently in Europe and North America, and it is from these regions that the report draws most evidence for its social science and political economy analyses. The modeling takes a more global perspective and in particular includes environmental and health benefits arising from diet change in middle-income countries, as underlined above... See also the World Economic Forum's options for the livestock sector in developing and emerging economies to 2030 and beyond. The role of livestock and meat for the world's poorest people needs special consideration. The report focuses on alternative proteins and meat, while acknowledging the importance of and exciting recent developments in dairy and fish alternatives. It does not explore the possibility of substituting protein with fish. Modeling this food type is especially complex because fish are particularly heterogeneous from a nutritional point of view. For example, different species of fish vary greatly in omega-3 fatty acids and have positive effects on health. And production methods vary significantly throughout aquaculture and capture fisheries. So, they don't want to use fish because, well... Well, that would be logical, right? There would be health benefits. We can't have that, though. We have to use something other than fish. <laughs> so, I'll tell you, this is crazy. Impacts of the adoption of alternate, alternative proteins. What difference would it make to the global food system and its effects on the environment, health, and other areas if the world made a transition from meat to meat substitutes, either traditional substitutes or novel protein alternatives, especially given that the global food system is complex, with many feedbacks and nonlinear effects? In this section, a first pass at addressing this question is presented. To model the food system, the research used a connected toolbox of models, the technical details of which have been described in the academic literature. Thirteen types of food were explored that can be placed in four categories. The first group contains different types of meat. The research focused on beef, pork, and chicken. The second class includes fruits and vegetables that can be consumed directly in an unprocessed state or as meat substitutes or which can be processed to different degrees so that they begin to have the appearance and mouthfeel of meat. Here the research looked at nuts, peas, beans, and the tropical jackfruit. <laughs> The jackfruit. Ah, that's great. The latter is consumed relatively infrequently outside Asia, but is increasingly attracting the attention as an export crop and a novel ingredient in other cuisines. As discussed below, analysis of these cases provides some insights into likely consequences of greater consumption of more sophisticated plant-based burgers. <laughs> Oh, they love their burgers, don't they? Like, they're, they're not thinking of any other type of meat form, are they? They're just thinking in terms of burgers. And, uh, you know, these people are talking about toolboxes and jackfruits. So, <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> How serious can you take these clowns? Uh, but they really are looking to transform the food system, folks. Let's read on here. The third category contains more processed non-animal products that are used as meat substitutes. Here, the research focused on tofu, which is derived from legume soybeans and has been a part of Asian cuisines for millennia. Wheat gluten products. Going to pause there. I'm not quite sure what gluten is, but I could tell you it is delicious, in, in fact. So, <laughs> gluten is delicious. Whatever it may be, if you get something without gluten in it, it, it loses its flavor. I don't understand. Uh, but anyway... And mycoprotein, which is derived from fermented fusarium fungus. Ooh, that sounds yummy. <laughs> the final category includes the most novel alternatives. The research examined cultured meat. Beef was chosen as a focus, recognizing the excellent research and innovation is also underway using chicken and fish. Insects in the form of flour made from crickets and the blue-green algae spirulina... Uh, 
and it's called Anthrospira, technically, cyanobacteria, but below referred to as algae. So it's they're talking about spirulina, uh, alga spirulina, which is actually uh, a, a healthy supplement that you could buy. Uh, from the pharmacy industry, so uh, they're they're talking or pharmaceutical industry, or uh, not so much the pharmaceutical, but the nutraceutical industry, I should say. Uh, they sell spirulina, uh, and it's supposed to have health benefits and things like that. But now they're talking about making food directly based on this, and this is, uh, you know, uh, referring directly back to things such as soylent green okay because they're talking about algae algae is the food source insects they're going to make cricket flour okay cricket flour <laughs> you want to eat the bugs uh, yay, yay. how much more could we go on here how to interpret food system models the function of this type of modeling exercise is not to try to predict the future but in the first place to help map out a space of possible futures this is helpful as policymakers concerned with say health need to know where encouraging the consumption of a particular meat substitute might have positive or negative effects and whether there might be trade-offs with other areas of policy concern such as greenhouse gas emissions we got to make sure that the cows aren't farting too too much right <laughs> gotta get rid of those pesky cows let's replace them with bugs that'll eat all the garbage <laughs> anyway let's read on here uh where were we uh, second quantitative modeling helps show what needs to be known to make better decisions constructing a model forces the quantification of a system and i'm going to pause there for a moment folks let's read that again pay close attention to these words constructing a model forces the quantification of a system and this is key to all the things they do they must quantify everything in order to better control the system this is cybernetics methodology in application right here let's read on uh, and as a result reveals knowledge gaps for example the research found that there were some products such as the meat sophisticated the, sorry the most sophisticated plant-based burgers that could not be included because sufficient relevant information was not available well because people don't freaking like them <laughs> Let's read on. Modeling also allows a better understanding to emerge as to what factors are the most important in determining outcomes. This helps to show not only where future developments may have the greatest impact, but also what parts of the food system will need to be understood in most detail to make good decisions. Finally, it is important to note that outputs... There's the word outputs, folks. Going to pause for a second. Outputs. That's a very cybernetics term right there. Very cybernetic -y term outputs because you're talking about inputs and outputs in a feed feed loop feedback loop i can't i can't even talk <laughs> um, note that outputs of any such quantitative system models are approximations to be challenged paradoxically this approach can sometimes be most useful when it produces results that experts in the field think unlikely with the process of working out why they occurred, increasing the understanding of how the system operates. Blah, blah, blah. Now, it gets into a lot of technical blah, blah here, okay? Uh, jargony blah, blah. So, uh, let's, let's go down a little bit here. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's... Here. <laughs> Here's the important, one of the important points here that they, they always have to tout because all of this has to do with the same old sustainable development nonsense that goes on, right? Greenhouse gas emissions. Switching from beef to alternative proteins can lead to significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, especially for transitions to plant or insect-based alternatives. And I'm going to pause for a second. Notice they, they are pushing the insect idea an awful lot. That's not by accident. Do you think we're really joking when we show a picture of Klaus Schwab saying you will eat the bugs? They're serious. They want you to eat bugs. <laughs> They're planning on that. They really think it's a great viable alternative to the cow farts that are destroying the earth, right? <laughs> so let's read on here. While current estimates of emissions from cultured beef suggest only modest reductions, depending on how production of cultured beef is scaled up, there is the possibility of significant emissions reductions as well. So yeah, so if you switch to bugs, right, there won't be as many cows around there wandering around farting. So... <laughs> 
We will save the planet. We will save the world with eating the bugs. You will eat the bugs. Greenhouse gases associated with the production of different types of food are estimated by life cycle analyses that attempt to track the full range of emissions along the value chain, including such factors as the transport of animals and their feed. Meta-analyses of LCA estimates are available for beef, processed wheat, nuts, beans, peas, and jackfruit. That's their new favorite thing, too, jackfruit. <laughs> jackfruit and bugs that that's the diet of the future jackfruit and bugs <laughs> bug flour jackfruit bread made with cricket flour right <laughs> that's that's what people will eat in the future the future is dumb folks i'm sorry the future is dumb <laughs> uh, the, where's my flying car <laughs> all the cartoons i watched as a kid lied to me I thought we'd have flying cars. That Mr. Spacely's a slave driver. He made me push the button four times today. <laughs> Where's that future I was promised? Instead, I have to eat bugs. <laughs> this is absurd. The future is dumb, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Anyway, let's read on here. Enough of my uh, <laughs> bantering on about my childhood and how I was lied to. Uh, let's read on here. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to move down a little bit here because it's all a lot of blah, blah, blase. Uh, jargon riddled nonsense here talking about this and that and the other thing. Uh, foods rich in potassium, blah, blah, blah. There's all kind of charts and stuff in here too. They like to compare and contrast a lot. Uh, I'll give the World Economic Forum that. They love their charts, don't they? They love to use charts. Uh, so now they're talking about nutrient intake. Let me find the important stuff. Oh, here we go. Food prices. <laughs> this one should be grand. All right. Food prices. Where are we at? Is on current prices, alternative proteins are not always competitive with meat. Well, they've, they've, they've fixed that problem, haven't they, the past two years now? <laughs> Now that problem's been fixed. So now maybe they are a little bit competitive with me, right? <laughs> so let's read on. Uh, the most novel alternatives are expensive, but will undoubtedly fall in price as production is scaled up. Unless interventions are made, however, pricing will not necessarily align with the benefits for health, nutrition, and the environment. So I'm going to pause there. They've made some interventions the past two years, haven't they? Of course, they, they went the other way with this and, you know, what uh, they're talking about here. But that's just because of, uh, you know, the concept of being able to use plausible deniability in this, right? So uh, they've they've already jacked up all the, uh, the prices of meat to be comparable with the al alternatives for meat. So uh, there's one step in place, whereas they're going to uh, try to shift the culture into accepting this. So the pricing won't be an issue now compared to, you know, how it was just a, a few short years ago. Let's see. Framing the future of meat and its alternatives. Uh, all right. Now here's their selling points, right? Individuals choose which particular types of food to eat based on price and by their intrinsic beliefs about what is good and bad about them. These beliefs are partially determined by the interplay of a complex set of narratives. <laughs> it's always narratives with these people, isn't it? The stories we tell each other about food. Many stakeholders seek to influence these narratives, no kidding, and understanding their dynamic interplay is essential to predicting how diets will evolve and how to encourage more sustainable and healthy food choices. So... Let's get this straight. So they're all about trying to change the narrative, right? They want to switch up the narrative. They want to, uh, you know, make you uh, feel and think a certain way about uh, certain types of food. So, uh, you know, it's, it's all about changing behaviors at the end of the day, right? In order to get you to accept something that you wouldn't normally eat, uh, <laughs> especially in the natural world, uh, that they will do this. So what are some of the things that are supportive narratives, okay? And this is what they talk about. They're talking about supportive narratives here in the next uh, phase of this paper. 
So it says here, foods containing alternative proteins help you live a healthier life. So they're going through the selling points here. Much of this messaging centers on the desirability of good quality protein and high protein foods. Much marketing material suggests alternative proteins are sources of physical power, providing fuel for healthy and adventurous lifestyles, as followed by people with desirable body aesthetics. Emphasizing the benefits of protein per se has been particularly important for insect-based products such as energy bars, their main presence in the market to date. I'm going to pause there. Did you know that? Did you know if you buy an energy bar, chances are it's got bug protein in it? Did you know? (laughs) A similar concentration on protein has been used to promote protein-rich diets such as the paleo diet, and in general, this has been part of a nutricentric trend in recent years and has seen protein treated as a specific food category. The emphasis on protein, a familiar nutrient category, also acts to blur the distinction between traditional animal-sourced foods and their possible substitutes. It can act to break down the assumption that protein must come from animal products, though narratives supportive of insect products may build on this assumption. (laughs) And I'm going to pause there. Boy, they like their insects, don't they? You will eat the bugs. You thought we were kidding about that, didn't you? <laughs> you really thought that was a big joke, didn't you? It's not a joke. They really want you to eat the bugs. Alternative proteins are also positioned as avoiding the unhealthy components of animal-based proteins, especially the high content of saturated fatty acids, and is containing more fiber, which has positive health benefits. Explicit claims, not always justified by the epidemiological literature, are often made that their consumption reduces the risks of cancer and cardiovascular disease. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to pause there. Uh, So now they're saying... explicit claims, and they say they're not always justified by the epidemiological literature, so they're saying, uh, you know, these are lies, right? (laughs) That uh, their consumption reduces the risks of cancer and cardiovascular disease. It is also claimed that alternative protein is free of other negatives associated with livestock, such as hormones and antibiotics. Claims often coupled with the exclusion of other ingredients with negative connotations for some people, such as soy, gluten, and genetically modified organisms, GMOs. So, there's there's a stark admission being made in that paragraph, folks, if you were paying attention. And I repeated it, because it says explicit claims are often made that their consumption reduces risks of cancer and cardiovascular disease. That's not so. There's There's no supporting... Uh, no supporting information to hold that argument up. So if anybody's telling you you'll be healthier, that uh, <laughs> if you eat these meat alternatives than you would from eating meat, well, that that's disingenuous. There's no evidence of that at all. It doesn't exist. It's admitted right here. So anyway, <laughs> it's it's all about uh, it's all about perception, isn't it, folks? Uh, so let's read on here. Here's their next selling point. Alternative proteins are free of the risk of food poisoning or contamination. Well, that's a lie, too. (laughs) Let's read on and see what it says here. Livestock production is often perceived as a messy business involving the management of animal waste and the slaughter of a living creature. There are many opportunities along the supply chain for food to become contaminated or spoiled, especially especially in countries where refrigeration is expensive and power supplies unreliable. Meat and animal products in high-income countries are probably safer today than at any time in history, yet periodic food scares involving meat and dairy do occur. I'm going to pause there. Uh, I remember just uh, like a few short years ago, there was a major contamination of lettuce. Friggin' lettuce that people were getting food poisoning from. So this is an invalid argument right out of the gate. (laughs) Lettuce. Uh, All right. Anyway, I rest my case on that. Uh, Let's read on here. The production of plant-based foods involves fewer opportunities for contamination or spoilage, while cultured meat production offers the promise of laboratory-level control of the whole process. The position of insect-based foods is less clear. In fact, or perception, some production facilities approach laboratory levels of control, while others make a virtue of using food waste as feedstock with less opportunity for close control. (laughs) So they're saying the bugs, 
right? The bugs, if you will, eat the bugs, the bug processing, it's much more like a laboratory setting, so there are less chances of contamination, unless, of course, we feed them all the garbage that nothing else will eat, <laughs> which was one of their main selling points for it in the first place, right? <laughs> anyway, let's read on here. The use of antibiotics as veterinary medicines, but particularly as growth promoters, is causing increasing concern as levels of antimicrobial drug resistance grow. Producing food that largely avoids the use of antibiotics is occasionally employed as an argument in favor of cellular meat or plant-based substitutes. In some of the dire warnings about the rise of antibiotic resistance come to pass, then society and decision makers can expect much more emphasis on this advantage. Okay, I'm going to pause there. So they're going to say, uh, the reason everybody's getting sick all of a sudden is because there's too much antibiotics being used in the food supply. So we need to do something about that. Uh, so that, you you know, these microbes will not make you sick anymore. Uh, so we have to switch. You need to eat the bugs now. <laughs> So, anyway, that, I tell you some of these, some of these arguments are really silly. Let's read on here and see what what's next here. Uh, the next one: products based on alternative proteins taste excellent. <laughs> no, they don't. Are you seriously going to sit here and try to tell me that that they taste excellent? <laughs> no, they don't. Not compared to a real friggin' steak. Okay. <laughs> Let's let's read on. I, I have to I have to read this I have to read this subsection here because I want to see what their argument is as to why these things or how these things taste excellent. Products based on alternative proteins taste excellent. Two barriers to the uptake of animal-free alternatives, particularly among meat eaters, are a lack of familiarity and negative perception of their sensory properties. <laughs> Building a narrative that promises the same taste, appearance, and overall eating experience as conventional animal foods has consequently been a central goal of those supportive or alternative protein developers. Statements such as, quote, the revolutionary plant burger that looks, cooks, and satisfies like beef, end quote, and, quote, mouth-watering juiciness and chew, end quote, supported by appropriate images and videos are common on websites and promotional material associated with these products. And I'm going to add, folks, and they're a total lie because you could tell the difference. It still does not taste like friggin' meat. I'm sorry. <laughs> Try as you may to convince us that it tastes like meat. It doesn't. Okay? It just doesn't. Such strategies work to shift perceptions of alternative protein eating from dull to desirable and emphasize that food which is good for us and the planet is also tasty to eat. This stress on pleasure can be further highlighted by including notions such as treating oneself to a guilt-free, guilty indulgence. <laughs> Who writes this crap? <laughs> guilt-free, guilty indulgence. <sighs> just when I think they can't get any more retarded. I haven't seen the word robust in here yet, though, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I don't know who they're trying to convince of this. They're, they're definitely not convincing the meat eaters, though. I'm sorry. Next point here. Alternative protein products are better for the environment. Well, of course they are. Didn't we go through that because the cows fart less, right? <laughs> if we don't have as many cows, there's less cow farts to, to crap up the atmosphere, right? <laughs> I'm not even going to... I'm just going to read the, the, the bullet points here that they have as to their, their reasons why these things are better, right? Alternative protein products do not harm animals. Is that right? Well, let me tell you something. Um, if you're going to switch from, say, a uh, a, a, a beef-based burger to a uh, a soy burger, well, here's the problem there. Okay, what's going to happen to all those cows that are already out there on the ranch on the farm? Well, they're going to be destroyed, aren't they? So you are indeed harming animals. There's going to be harm done. You, you can't just take this thing out of nature that belongs in the natural realm somewhere and, uh, you know, effect, expect that there's going to be no negative impact of, of such a thing. 
Let's read on here. Alternative proteins promote food security by releasing land currently used to grow animal feed for the production of human food. <laughs> well, is that right? So now you're arguing that uh, the land you're using to feed the livestock that you're using to feed the people, well, now you could just directly use that land to feed the people. That's, that, that's your argument here? Well, it's six of one, half dozen of another, isn't it? <laughs> Same difference. <laughs> it's just you're trying to do it in an unnatural way now. All right, let's read on. Here's cautionary narratives are next. So they're saying here, uh, let's see, alternative protein products will always play just a minor role in the global food system. So these are narratives they want to avoid, these cautionary narratives. So they don't want the alternative uh, protein product to play a minor role in the food system. They want it to play a major role, right? Well, here's the next point. Alternative protein products are not real food. They don't want people to think that these are not real food. Well, hey, you guys just said so right here. So, I mean, what are we supposed to think about that? Next one, alternative protein products are not as good as the real thing. I'm not going to argue with that point. I think that's that's a true statement. But they don't want people to realize that, see? Uh, so that's that's why they're they're pushing so hard. These are the narratives they want to avoid. Now, we just read the narratives that they want to promote, and these are the ones they want to avoid. But uh, by and large, I think these are the ones that the public has really taken a hold of right now, right? The next point here, livestock is more than food. And this is probably their only, you know, articulate point being made here. And, uh, you know, I would tend to agree with that statement. Livestock is more than food, right? Let's read this paragraph and see what they have to say. The final cautionary narrative stresses the non-food contributions to society of the livestock industry and points out that livestock production can have positive as well as negative externalities. In particular, it highlights the importance of the industry's contribution in many countries' GDP and also its special role in supporting local rural economies. For example, livestock production is the only viable form of agriculture in many European uplands and North American dryland regions, and its disappearance would substantially affect jobs and the socioeconomic sustainability of local communities. This narrative is often expressed as a reaction to the demonization of meat, especially by urban as opposed to rural commentators, and people with a liberal as opposed to conservative worldview. It enlists the fact that many people in developing countries are reliant on livestock not only for food, but as stores of wealth. It can interpret rich country concerns about livestock as neo-colonial attacks on cultures in which livestock and livestock production are central. And that's a good point, isn't it? So uh, I, I think they're losing their own argument here by bringing forward these, these points, aren't they? And then it talks about different regional variations, and then it goes into political economy. Uh, let's read on here. I think we're just about done here. I'm going to wrap it up here in just a few minutes. Um, accelerating the adoption of alternative proteins. So here's what they want to do in order to do that. The challenge of meeting the protein needs of a mid-century population of 10 billion people in an inclusive, sustainable, healthy, and nutritious manner is enormous but achievable. What is clear is that this will not happen on our current business-as-usual trajectory. Significant transformation of the protein system is essential to achieve the strategic development goals and to meet the Paris Agreement climate change targets. Gonna pause there. So it's all about their contrived global warming, isn't it? Their climate change, sorry, because it's not really global warming and it's not the uh, mini ice age as they were predicting in the 70s. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it always changes. So it, it's either global cooling, global warming, whatever. So they decided they'll just call it climate change, right? So, uh, you know, it, it's all about that. The new wave of alternative proteins and the vision of what they can deliver in the future provide an exciting set of options that can help with this transformation. The modeling in this report shows that different types of alternative protein can substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions and can contribute to a reduction in diet-related mortality. 
To make a meaningful impact, however, it is clear that a combination of well-orchestrated public and private actions must be accelerated to drive transformative change at scale, both globally and in different regions and within different supply chains and markets. The analyses in this report identify a number of significant intervention points at which such actions must may be the most effective. So, I think that says it all, doesn't it? I think that says it all. So, what ways are they going to go ahead and try to uh, accelerate this process, right? Because that's what they're talking about. They want to uh, make a transformative change at scale, as they say here. So, they want to change the food system, regardless of the point that nobody really wants it changed or transformed in this way. Uh, All based on the false premise of climate change, of man-made climate change, right? Of the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the temperature may go up or down, like, (laughs) periodically, as it always has from the beginning of time, and man has nothing to do with that. Uh, But the the argument here is, well, because we farm so much and we have so many cows out there farting, it affects the climate, so we need to do something. (laughs) We need to switch to the bugs. (laughs) Uh, so anyway, so what what are they going to do to meet these goals? Well, number one here, it says, avoiding unintended consequences of alternatives. We won't go into each subsection here in detail, but uh, I just want to read off these points. Number two, blending production realities and social science to drive increased con- conversion to alternative protein sources in middle and high income countries. So what does this mean? This means they want to try to change... Uh, the way the food market works in, you know, major first world countries, and uh, switch to different alternatives here, such as the bugs. <laughs> so <laughs> let's read on. Next point, accelerating investment. So, of course, all these eggheads are, and billionaires are going to invest their money into uh, various facets of this and one of those would be like when mr bill gates decided he's going to buy up all the farmland and then not use it right that's what's going to happen he's going to buy up all the land and there will be less production then and this will force people to have to go to some of these alternative methods right if uh, enough of these guys invest wisely in real estate because that's that's a, a a valuable asset to have real estate it's one of the one of the things that holds the most intrinsic value left in this world, real estate, if you can actually uh, claim ownership of a piece of real estate or property, um, this is a real tangible asset that has real value. And this is proof positive of that. Uh, so that's that's one of the uh, basic tenets here. They're going to buy up the land, the farmland, and not use it. So this will force their hand here. This will force people to have to switch to an alternative. If there's not enough farms producing enough traditional food sources, well, then you're going to have to get the bug paste, aren't you? So (laughs) you have no choice. Uh, So they're talking about accelerating investment. Next, creating incentives. And I think we'll read this section here. The interaction between alternative and traditional proteins is not a zero-sum game, despite some narratives that imply it is. There are enormous opportunities for multiple stakeholders and society in general to gain, particularly if decision makers can look beyond single measures of success to a more systemic view of the food system, one that is inclusive, sustainable, healthy, and nutritious, and productive. (laughs) Of course, they got to use all their buzzwords, right? Alternative protein products do have the potential to disrupt the food system, which threatens established livelihoods. The sector is not alone in this regard, for this is a challenge currently faced by all industries experiencing the Fourth Industrial Revolution. A better understanding of how the political economy of the food system works can help reduce tensions and assist policymakers identify groups that may be at risk of impact, and proactively help them. For example, affected livestock producers might be assisted to produce higher value but lower volume products. (laughs) They're going to cut down your production. That's what I said, right? Uh, The new approach... The UK has announced of paying farmers for the provision of economic services. 
quote, public money for public goods, end quote, illustrates another policy option with potential multiple beneficiaries. And I'm going to pause there, folks. So what they're presenting here is an idea that's that's absurd and retarded on the face of it. So what they're saying is, yes, uh, we will try to convince the farmers to produce less product, but more valuable product. Well, this is a basic supply and demand kind of a scenario, isn't it? If you reduce the supply of say beef well naturally the price of beef goes up so then your farmer who has less cows now than he used to is commanding a higher price per cow per se right Uh, simply because there's less of them now Uh, so this will drive up the price so yes he will make more money and this is exactly what they're trying to leverage here so they're trying to convince the smaller to down the, the they're trying to convince the farmer to downsize right? So you downsize your operation, you make, uh, you know, the same amount of money on less, uh, you know, livestock. Uh, And, you know, they they will clamp down further and further as this whole thing progresses uh, to make it a more uh, viable option here to uh, go to some protein alternative, right? Uh, so so that's that's essentially what they're saying though this is how they will go ahead and uh, buy up the farmland right so you you could see how 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 devious this idea really is when you you get down to the the brass tacks of it all so they're going to convince the individual farmers that uh, they could uh, reduce their production and still make a good amount of money on this and uh, tighten up the supply chain, right? They'll tighten up the supply and demand uh, facet of this whole thing. And therefore, uh, the farmer will have excess land then that he doesn't need because he's reduced his stock that he has. And so, you know, they'll step in, these, these, you know, billionaires and such, will step in and offer to buy up the land at a, a pretty good value for the farmer. And so he could have a nice, convenient retirement, per se. And they'll buy the farmland and not use it. So uh, this this is just a means of reducing the production. This is how you create artificial scarcity, folks. That's what they're doing here. They're going to create artificial scarcity of meat products in order that you have no choice but to buy their alternatives to it. Do you see? Uh, it's the tightening of the grip of control. So anyway, that's the whole point here. And we really didn't touch on the esoteric side of this. Uh, I, I think maybe that, that'll be it a show for another day because uh, this harkens back to the whole uh, the whole biblical trope of Cain and Abel Cain being the farmer right the the one who worked the land and uh, produced uh, the vegetation and the crops and Abel was the um, the, the animal handler right uh, so there was this uh, division uh, within these brothers along those lines and and a lot of these ideas and ideologies stem directly from that uh, but we'll explore that another day because uh, uh we're about up to time here and i, I think uh, you know we've spent enough time here i just wanted to go ahead and point out the fact that the world economic forum most definitely is uh you know orchestrating a war on meat and uh, this is how they're doing it and uh, when we tell you when that klaus schwab says you will eat the bugs we're not kidding this is the real deal you can look up this uh, this white paper it's easy to find and i'll repeat the title of it here for you uh, so that you could go ahead it's called meet the future series alternative proteins world economic forum published january 2019 and there it is so uh you know the, the end of the day, the bottom line is, you will eat the bugs, right? That's what Klaus wants. That's what they're pushing for. <laughs> so let's not let them get away with this, all right? Uh, we, we see the writing on the wall with this whole thing. And we're watching what's been happening with the supply chain now for the, the past uh, past almost entire year now, how the, the prices of everything are going through the roof and there's empty shelves on the s- stores and like, it's, it's just absurd and ridiculous, and it's all contrived. That's the thing that drives me the most mad. It's all contrived, this whole artificial scarcity narrative that they're pushing and promoting. And it's all about control, tightening the control and, uh, you know, centralizing everything. 
And, and that's the whole point here. That's what they're doing. And this is a World Economic Forum plan. And it goes across borders and all over the place to different areas as well. So uh, a lot of this is being orchestrated by the World Economic Forum and some of their forerunners there. So you can see that there's their agenda, folks. It's, it's right there in that paper, right? Uh, so you can understand what the nuts and bolts behind this are. And anyway, that's that's about it. So, uh, you know, they, they want you to eat the bugs. Uh, so they want to replace your meat with bugs. Bug paste, bug flour, cricket flour. Uh, you'll eat the crickets and you'll be happy, right? You will own nothing and you'll be happy and you'll eat the bugs. That, that's what they want you to do. That's what the future looks like here, folks. The future is dumb. I'm sorry. Where's our flying cars, right? <laughs> We were promised flying cars. We don't have that. Instead, we have the bugs. <laughs> all right. That's that's all I got for tonight, folks. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for stopping out. Take care. Come with me. Baby